So we water a course just to see what the lie of the land might be. Uh, and then a small excavation just there at the foot of the escarpment. Uh, being responsible archaeologists, we of course did a season of a uh, short, short spell of uh, magnetometer survey uh, to see what was there. And uh, we knew in any case that we would run across the Ptolemaic north wall of the Anubiaeon. Uh, we were hoping to pick up something else, uh, but uh, sadly, although not unexpectedly, uh, this entire region has been used for so long as a dumping ground by archaeologists like Emery, uh, by uh, local, uh, local people, of course the uh, local village up top here, that there's so much interference, so much modern buzz fuzz, that you actually don't get a very clear uh, magnetometer picture, except for huge features like the wall itself, which is 14 metres wide and rather difficult to miss. <laughs> so, a small pilot excavation here too, um, uh, uh, to pick up the line of the uh, new Yale wall. I'm sorry, some of this has got uh, block, blocked out, but you get the, the general picture. Uh, so, here's the, the wall itself, with all its uh, demolition, debris, collapse, um, interspersed with sandy episodes of the kind that we might expect. <coughs> There's the um, north face of the wall, uh, again uh, with enormous bricks, uh, as are often used for uh, monumental structures of this kind. The sort we were, of course, entirely different in date, but of the sort that Joe was talking about uh, at uh, Koisna. <coughs> and then we had to leave it, sadly, because as you see, the water table is encroaching, uh, even though it's, it's a time of year when it's relatively low lying. But this is interesting in itself, because what we do have here is clear evidence that uh, even structures as late in the sequence as Ptolemaic and Roman, and their demolition debris, which must be <coughs> later probably medieval, uh, all of this lies very low, low down, like below the modern water table. In fact, it all lies lower down than the Old Kingdom Valley Temples at, uh, for example, the, uh, the UNS Pyramid and at that museum. So another indication, perhaps, that uh, all is not as simple as we perceived it to be, uh, and that we've got a very different uh, landscape from the one that's uh, usually, usually projected. Now, we had hoped to go on, to this, on with this, and uh, I'm sure I've uh, mentioned this before, um, but my frustration and irritation is so intense that I have to keep coming back to it. <laughs> uh, because we, we had the perfect site, we had every, everything was set up. Uh, and of course at this point, the what was then the Supreme Council for Antiquities decided in its great wisdom uh, to build all over it. So, uh, and to add insult to injury, threw us out of our dig house, it was on the uh, top of the escarpment at the same time. And nothing particularly uh, exclusive in that. We've all been ejected or evicted or uh, resettled uh, to some extent. Uh, but the pity is that almost no uh, prospective work was done before this building uh, uh, took place. Um, so what we are virtually certain is part of the early dynastic and extended Old Kingdom settlement now lies beneath these brutalist structures of the 21st century. Uh, just to show, just to give you an idea, this is what it looked like when I first went out to Egypt in the 1970s. Uh, pristine environment. Why didn't we do it then, you could ask. Uh, well, we didn't know. Um, but there it goes. And uh, even as recently as 2000, uh, it's all still recoverable. Apart from anything else, my regret is that uh, this was for the people living here, the, the Egyptian residents of this, of this area, um, this was their playground. You know, in hot weather, they would drag their TV sets out into the, into the, the sand and sit down and watch the football or whatever. Um, this area here between Abusir and Saqqara uh, was a regular route for wedding processions. It was part of the social fabric of the, of the region. And now it's all gone. There's a big wall around it. Just as there's a big wall around Giza, around Helwan, or actually not around Helwan, but through the middle of the Helwan Cemetery, uh, uh, over the river, um, all the 
I suspect that almost anywhere you go in Egypt in the next few years, you will come across an archaeological site that has been protected by having a great concrete wall built around it. What it does, of course, is say to everybody, right, this is what's important, this end, and you can't come in, and you can't even look at it, because these walls are four meters high. And it says that everything out here you can build on is not important. But of course, for us as settlement archaeologists, that's exactly where you want to do the investigative archaeology. That the stuff on the inside is, is there. It's not going anywhere. Um, but all of this stands to be lost in the next few years. Anyway, that's enough of my rant. Uh, just, oh, it's just to compare again, looking southwards, what the landscape was like before this wall was built along here. And uh, to this isn't entirely irrelevant to uh, the question of pyramids because um, uh, what we're trying to do now is understand the broader setting of Memphis and its, uh, and its location. Uh, we are as certain as we can be, for reasons that I hope I've explained, uh, that the Nile has been moving, in this region at least, has been moving inexorably eastwards until the present day, and now it's as far east as it can go. It's right up against the desert gravels uh, of Helwan, Um, but also, it's more complicated than that, we think. We've had uh, my colleague uh, Judith Bunbury at Cambridge and her students uh, have, uh, in the last few years, built up a computer model um, based on historical evidence of, of how the, the river has moved. Uh, and this sort of looks a bit like Spaghetti Junction. This is uh, a diachronic um, uh, uh, projection. Uh, so it's not how it actually was, necessarily, but it's a projection over the last 5,000 years. And our task now, if we're spared, is to try to test this, this model. Now, one of the interesting things relating to pyramids is that uh, we suspect here's where the later dynastic site of Memphis is, here's where dynastic, early dynastic and old kingdom Memphis is. Um, we think that it's highly likely that the location of, of the site there is because that's where the delta started at that time. That by the end of the fourth millennium uh, BC, the Nile started to split uh, even though the delta proper, according uh, as it appears nowadays, is, is up here, but we have already a dual course uh, of the of the Nile in the Memphite region. When you think about it, think about Joseph's uh, uh, pyramid, for example, naturally effects step pyramid. What is one of well, it's not there anymore, but uh, one of the uh, key uh, features of the uh, step pyramid is the. Uh, the little lookout post, the Serdab, on the north side of the pyramid, where originally the original statues were uh, reproduction there now, but the original statue looked out through these two depots over the delta and over the split river. This is where you know, the delta actually, actually uh, uh, took effect. And what we're playing with at the moment, what we're working on, is the idea that at, at, at different times through the Old Kingdom, um, the location of pyramids uh, might relate to directly to where the river was, or uh, but not directly, but indirectly to where the river was, because the location of areas of settlement must be conditioned by the location of the river. And the pyramids reflect that. What it also means is that we perhaps ought to be thinking of a very different uh, settlement model from the kind that we usually um, presume uh, to have existed in Pharaonic Egypt, um, partly because of parallels with uh, Mesopotamia and the Levant and so on, we're accustomed to think of highly nucleated, walled, uh, compact um, uh, uh, city sites. Uh, but maybe at a place like Memphis, you didn't need highly compact, walled, fortified sites. We don't really know of any fortifications at all in Memphis. And, we saw uh, earlier on that uh, there aren't any elephant in either. And there is a persuasive idea that the river actually operates as a military defense. Elephant is a clear, clear cut case. <coughs> but there are several, again, classical uh, references to sieges and battles, uh, usually the Persian period, um, uh, in the Memphite region. And there's, there are several telling references uh, uh, 
uh, to the way that the river was manipulated and sluices were opened, for example, in order to defeat Isidu, Isidu armies. Right, so that brings us up to present day, not a moment too soon. Um, what do we do for the future? Well, we've been blocked, as you saw, from continuing uh, one strand uh, of the uh, uh, survey work. Um, but just a couple of seasons ago, well, we also we came back with our coring equipment uh, to test a number of, uh, of hypotheses, a number of uh, possibilities. And one of these is that to the west of Mitrahina, where the modern town of Saqqara is, um, there is a huge and uh, easily identifiable uh, dry valley, wadi, uh, the wadi Tafla, uh, that splits off South Saqqara from Middle Saqqara. And that lies directly opposite the dynastic site of uh, at Mitrahina. And we were playing with the idea that perhaps sand brought down this wadi, uh, spread out into the uh, uh, floodplain, as we know it as further north, uh, near the Saqqara necropolis, uh, and might actually have been instrumental in the first colonization of the Mitrahina site, uh, which then become, later becomes the, uh, the main uh, dynastic center. Um, so, this is uh, Yun Shin, one of Judith Bunbury's uh, students, uh, uh, treating the soil samples as they come up. <coughs> and that's our coring team. And what we've, what Yun has come up with is the idea that, um, in fact, because we know that Agnet training itself, the uh, pre-settlement, pre-colonization uh, layers are, again, pure sand, uh, but they, it, it's a very different kind of sand from different in, in texture, different in uh, uh, content from the Eolian sands that we picked up uh, near the desert edge. So that sand of Mitrahina has to be uh, attributed to a different cause. Probably, most likely, uh, local river conditions, possibly even a turtleback of the kind that uh, we saw this morning with Joe that uh, uh, Kawisna has built, built on. Now we want to follow that up. Um, things aren't over yet, we are not entirely disheartened and dismayed, um, there's still work to do. So uh, what we want to do is come back to... I'll skip that because I'm running a short time. Come back to the, the site of Mitrahina itself, uh, this is where our cores were two years ago, and concentrate on this area here, the southwest, southwestern, midwestern part of the Baruin field. I'm sorry, that was an archive photograph and it hasn't come through on this. <laughs> it was a very nice archive photograph. We can describe it to you in great detail. Um, uh, it's actually an excavation of the 1950s, uh, about the time that that air photograph that I showed earlier was, was taken. Um, and as so often at Mitrahina, as, as so often at uh, Memphis, uh, it was an entirely chance discovery um, because the uh, uh, local governorate was driving a tourist road through the middle of the site. Um, they had started in the east and had arrived at this point on the west. And then the last thing that they came across was this uh, group burial of uh, quite impressive um, family vaults, uh, rather similar to the uh, to the uh, uh, tombs that we were looking at uh, uh, earlier, with well, originally with red and uh, polygrade paint. Uh, inside. But more importantly, perhaps, this is the earliest thing, the earliest in situ archaeological find at Memphis. It's first intermediate period or very early uh, Middle Kingdom. Uh, but alongside, just here, an excavation was done in just about the time we started, in fact, in the early 1980s. Uh, and that is definitely settlement running up to the eastern face of the, of the uh, cemetery itself. So here we have the earliest thing at Memphis, in situ. We have the possibility of uh, excavating alongside it through Middle Kingdom and possibly into Old Kingdom layers, which would be the first time that any uh, standing, very standing Old Kingdom uh, 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 archaeology has been discovered. And most uh, encouragingly of all, 
what we're going to do this season, uh, as I said, if we're spared and if the uh, political, uh, political climate allows us to, uh, what we want to do is start a collaboration with Mark Lehner's team from Giza and to run a field school for young Egyptian students and uh, potential inspectors, uh, as they have been doing in Giza, but, but shifting that to, to Memphis. So it's a really exciting uh, uh, potential uh, direction that we could be, we could be going in. And also find something quite interesting in the process. So, as I say, to mix metaphors, watch the space, but don't hold your breath. Um, uh, so, there it is. Um, as I say, all of this feeds into the question of why pyramids are where they are. Uh, uh, we, we, we made a start in trying to uh, explain the location of these pyramids, but also I hope we're getting people to think uh, more naturally, more constructively about how these pyramids might reflect the reality of the Egyptian capital. So we'll see. Thank you very much.